Do you enjoy singing praises to the Lord? Yeah. It sounds like you do. Amen. It's, it really is a, a sweet thing that you have and I have together. We have. It's part of this incredible love that the Lord has for us and the love that you have for one another. It's part of uh, in Christ alone. Live faith. Love others. Declare hope. We've been in this study since last June in uh, 1 Corinthians. I'm hoping to finish it by next June. Um, just got a little ways to go, but uh, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 13 beautiful verses. Uh, thank you, some of you, for moving forward, sitting in some of the seats. It's a leftover setup a little bit from last night's dinner theater. What a time we had. Thank you, God. Once again, everybody... Give a round of applause to the tech team, the actors, the drama people, our leaders, the Myers, and of course, our students. They did a great job. There was 20, excuse me, 23 of them still burping up the chicken dinner. So sorry about that. Anybody got any Tums? No, no, it's okay. I'm sure you do. You got lots of, lots of nice. <laughs> but it was a success in so many ways. Again, all the people that joined in, they, they practiced, they rehearsed, they worked on their parts, and then they did all that they could. Uh, people even up here on the stage, part of things, uh, doing a single, double, and triple duty to serve the Lord, to bring the gospel to people. Josh did a great job at the end, uh, bringing a great uh, message, a short message, tying things together on the brokenness of Humpty Dumpty. I have never heard a devotion on the brokenness of Humpty Dumpty. And so it was good. He tied it together with the good, uh, excuse me, not the good Samaritan, forgive me, but the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. So uh, we had a wonderful evening. And, and again, the drama team, my oh my, you have been given a special talent and you've decided in your spirit gift mix to allow God to use you to serve. And in the name of Jesus, you've blessed so many people. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Just as again, we get together on a Sunday morning, and there's a, a few people that come to sing here, but um, they're just coming alongside of you. They're saying, we just want to be part of worship, and we want to be part of praise, and we want to be part of giving thanks unto the Lord. We're going to be standing here, maybe playing some instruments and singing, but you partake and be part of it to give glory and lift the name of Jesus. And that's exactly how things ought to be in the church, in the ministry, and how we go about things. That's the way we do what we do and why we do what we do at First Bible Baptist Church. And I'm very thankful for all of you and uh, so that you can know. And uh, I think we just need to cheer the Lord. We raised together uh, $2,150 last night for the young people. They are going to split that. And I told them we'd round it up to 2300 so each kid that served gets uh, $100. And uh, that's pretty awesome, so praise the Lord. Um, but I have to say that, and I see I'm just, Addie came up and said, oh, it's okay, Brownie. Uh, there's maybe a kid or two that might not be able to go. They said, just go ahead and use the money. So you don't need to round it up. So I turned to Josh and I said, Josh, I've been teaching you this. Don't refuse the cash. <laughs> don't, don't, just take the blessing. And so Addie's smiling. No, Brownie, you know I'm very, I said, I know, I know. But this is a gift, and so we'll round it up. And she had a tough time with that. It was good. It's like, it's all of us don't like being given the gift sometimes. We, oh, I, I know. But yeah, that's, uh, that's something we can do. We can round it up, and uh, if somebody happens to still give, to the youth ministry summer camp primed can use funds always to sponsor students to go to camp and the camp of course is in your handout when is it well it's first part of july primed hs and jh that means high school and junior high summer camp they're going to be going off in july so make sure that if something uh, from the Lord is put upon your heart and you think it's doing go, you know, I'd like to give and maybe help some young student and help more students to get a scholarship because a lot of times they just can't afford the cost of camp and over the years, what a blessing 
to be able to sponsor young people to go to camp. Uh, so very, very good blessings, tremendous blessings from the Lord. We enter into a chapter in your Bible uh, today, chapter 13, that is uh, well known in that it's used oftentimes for, hey, you know about love and that love chapter in chapter number 13 and the greatest of these is uh, faith, hope, and love, charity. Uh, uh, the greatest of these is charity. It's love, so you know that's the way it should be. And so we do it with weddings oftentimes, relationship building. Um, it might get a little cool in here. I turned the air conditioning down to 47, so is that okay? Everybody okay? I see Linda has a coat on. Amen. I'm doing well. This is getting stuffy. I think I'm in trouble, Jerry. I better preach fast and get going here, don't I? No slowing down. It's getting a little stuffy. We actually had a, the smell from the chicken last night. I was trying to recirculate it a little bit. And uh, hopefully you don't get too hungry. But back to what I was saying. I think oftentimes, when it comes to Scripture, we get familiar with it according to maybe the first or second time we heard it taught to us. Or when it was maybe a devotion, or maybe it was some time, you go, oh, I got a couple verses out of that passage, and so now you're locked in. And so again, you go to 1 Corinthians 13, you go, oh, I've heard this read at a, at a wedding. I've heard it read at different settings. I've, I've uh, had it in premarital, or I've had it in marriage counseling, and you know, it talks about all the stuff that only married people are supposed to do. So really, basically, this chapter is only for married people that are having troubles with their marriage. So all of you that are not having trouble with your marriage, you can leave now. That's a joke. Don't calm down. You notice I'm still here. There's a big problem with Brian and Tammy. She's sitting over there and you're sitting here. <laughs> you started it. I wouldn't have paid attention, but you drew, you drew, drew me there. Uh, I know. You're not on the mission field anymore. You can be together. This is your new mission field. Tammy, this is your mission field. <laughs> He's right there. But again, it comes into, again, this place of, hey, I know the passage is just shut the doors. And we're going to look at it a little differently this morning and praying through it. 12, 13, and 14, real quick, I'll remind you, we'll get into it, is, hey, a gift time here. We spiritual gifts in chapter number 12, chapter number 14. About spiritual gifts. So 13, of course, God just inserted it because love is important, charity, and that's it. No, no, it's tied together to the gifts. Remember the last verse of chapter number 12, it says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. That verse is relating to what was spoken about before with all those questions about are all apostles are all so. That's the first half of the verse. The second half is leading into the next passage the next chapter so it gives you kind of a conjunction an and and an if this is what's going on from god's word this whole series we've been looking at something that reminds us of really who we are as an acts 1 8 church and our acts 1 8 church mission and you look on the front it says up there live faith love others declare hope there's a reason this is on there God just led us to that about a year or two ago, a couple years back, where we see that, hey, it's kind of like a, a quick purpose statement that ties together with the mission that God's put us upon. And you say, okay, well, live faith. Well, we spent some time in Galatians looking at free to live faith when we looked at the faith side of it a couple years back. We hit into this year in the summer knowing we were going to go through and go into this fall and into the winter time and go into a place of, hey, we're going to have a time of love others, which is interacting and loving one another. Do we love one another and how do we love others? Charity. Love never fails. So when we think about the last piece, declare hope, we'll head into that here in the later this summer in our next study when God brings us to the conclusion of this study on Sunday mornings. This chapter, again, is used for a lot of different reasons. But I want to look at it collectively and corporately as a church because he's writing it to the church. And it is a bridge. It is something that ties together with the gifts and the essence of charity and how, of course, 
Without charity, you have nothing. I'm fearful that a number of people live in that place. They don't really know what charity in their life can really do for them. They hear about it, and like so many other topics, they hear a message on it, the Holy Spirit talks to them, they have a devotion, they read their Bible every day, or maybe just a few times a week, and they go, yeah, I know that charity thing, uh, that love, that agape thing, and uh, I'm a Christian, I love the Lord, I come to church, but I don't know how far I want to go with it. I know people have been saved 30, 40, 50 years that really have not gotten a handle on many things in the Bible and allowed Jesus Christ to really implant in them the things of Jesus. That they're not conformed, that we're not conformed, that a lot of us live in a place of not being conformed or going to a place of letting God conform us to the image of Christ. You see, Christianity is more than just identifying with and attending a church. God equipped each of us in a very special way to enable the body corporately to fulfill the Great Commission. It says in Romans chapter number 12, for as we have many members in one body, remember I had this verse up here last week, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Verse 7, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, and he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Even there, reading again, another passage of Scripture relating to how the church is to view spirit gifts, and we talked about that last week, that Paul did speak to spiritual gifts here in Romans. He did it in 1 Corinthians. There's some neat parallels there. But you see that three of those gifts are about speaking. Four of those gifts are about serving. And you could have the sign gifts, as again, we looked through that the last couple weeks. The bottom line is these spiritual gifts are real, and whether or not you are allowing God to use them in this church, that's something that's on you personally. Can the pastor nudge you and talk about things? Absolutely. Can some of our spiritual leaders do that? Some of the men and women who are more mature in the Lord and they may work with you, mentor you, disciple you in any form or fashion. I'm very thankful for so much of that. Some of the women's studies, some of the things with our guys' studies. I mean, different things get people to a point where you go, wow, I never considered that I could be involved in the church in a certain way and I don't have to have some great spiritual gift and all of a sudden God gives you a spirit gift and you're you go, wow, I see. I see how it works. I need to get involved. I need to serve a little bit. I need to just sign up and be part of things and ask God to wire me. God, arm me so that I may fit. You see, a church that faithfully uses its gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit is ca characterized by fellowship, worship, evangelism, submission, love, obedience, unity, and ministry or servanthood. You see, that slide we had up last week points to a lot of you saying, hey, I'd like to be involved. I see that this church, and those of you that are standing outside looking around and saying, hey, I'm not sure where I should fit, but I'd like to, then you're going, okay, does this church do this stuff? Well, we have fellowship. We have places to serve and ministry. There's a unifying spirit in a lot of ways. In fact, there's a lot of love that goes around here in loving others. I'd say that we have a really neat church family. And to me, it behooves us with all that God's given us, to whom much is given, much is required, that we would say, okay, I'm going to dedicate my body, like Romans 12, 7 says, <laughs> being a living sacrifice. I'm going to put off the world, and I'm not going to let the world be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And then I'm going to go down through this, verses 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and go, okay, God, I want to be part of the other believers and what they're doing to serve. I want to cooperate with the mission of the church. I want to grasp the vision of the pastor and the leader and say, okay, what are we doing? 
And then God will activate your gifts. And there you are. You're in a place where Paul is teaching this church and how we're being taught by the Holy Spirit. Hey, you can be used by God in the right manner, in the right attitude. You see, the name of our series, Love Never Fails, comes into play. You look at verse number 8, charity never faileth. That's it right there. But whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Everything will fail when it doesn't have charity wrapped into it. But when charity is at the forefront, it is part of who we are as a church, it is our personality, then I see where we can be so successful in carrying out the mission for so many years. You say, well, I can point out to you, Pastor, a lot of the weaknesses. Thank you. I can point out to you a lot of things that you don't do right. I can point out to you where the spiritual gifts in the mix of your church just... And that's fine. Maybe we just are not as good looking as some of the churches. But I would say at the core and the root of this ministry, there's a charity love, an agape love. I have witnessed it. I've been part of it. My family knows how much you love us. And you know how much we love you. And how much others of you love each other. Who in the world would do what they did last night, dressing up the way they did unless they loved Jesus Christ and loved the church? Ken, your majesty on high. I mean, no, not on high. Forgive me, that's wrong. I don't be blasphemous. I mentioned earlier, I'm really considering dealing with my administrative assistant. I'm concerned that she loved what she did last night way too much. Dwayne, we can't have her in the place that she's in now. She wants to cut everybody's head off. That's not charity. We have a conflict here. Brian, I don't know what we're going to do. But to pull that all together is part of pushing out the message of Jesus Christ and the spirit gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're about to do that through voices on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, with some beautiful music. If there were a time where you might say, boy, I've been talking to people, I, I know people go to church on Easter time, Resurrection Sunday maybe, we'll make sure there's enough seats in here. We'll have all the other stuff going on, just make sure, because there will be a spiritual gift working and operating through the people of First Bible because of charity. In chapter 12, the context is the purpose of the gifts. In chapter 14, is the, perver the perverted part of it, the perversion of the gifts. Right in the middle of this, Paul is instructed by the Holy Spirit to pen the scripture on charity and remind us that it's a more excellent way. This is what it is. It is charity. It's not the eros side of love, which is that romantic, sensual love. It's not philia, which is that friendship, brotherly love type of love. It's agape. It's agape love that we talked about when we introduced this series back in June, where in your concordance there's G26 and G25 next to that word. When you look up the concordance and you see where you can look up all the places, it's mentioned 28 times, charity is. You see, in the purpose of chapter 12, again, is the gifts. The purpose of chapter 14 is uh, to show us the perversion but today, chapter 13, I want you to see, I've said it a couple times, that in chapter 13, we are going to see the personality of the gifts. The personality. The purpose in one spot, the perversion in the other, but this is the personality of the gifts. How Jesus Christ and his personage, you and I take on that personality. We take it on in Jesus, we take it on in charity, we take it on in a selfless self-sacrifice way and say charity is our personality charity needs to stay our personality and it needs to really grow in us that's why i entitled our message we have a great personality that's not to pat us on the back and lift us up we don't believe in that puffed up stuff we believe in what god is doing in us 
in our study on Sunday mo uh, Saturday mornings about humility. We looked at a guy named David yesterday. We looked at a guy, Samson, uh, last week. A couple weeks back, we looked at Moses. We looked at Abraham. Guys that got messed up on things that they did, and God still used them in some small way. Because at one time or another, they saw humility to be important. And humility can lead to the grace of charity. If you and I stick our chest out and we are prideful and arrogant and we are already self-consumed on how wonderful we are and how we love people with conditions and we don't forgive people because we are a conditional person, then the personality that we bring to the table for the personality of the church is not charity. That means that for us in general to look like this type of personality as a church I'm very, very thankful, and I can see it, and as I said earlier, witness it, and I've watched it from afar, and I've witnessed it up close, and in my interactions with so many of you. But today I want you to learn, and I want us to learn how we can add into our lives, just like 2 Peter says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. I know you're going to cover this soon in 2 Peter. Add to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge of temperance, and to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. They're closely related, but it's a little bit further because, again, brotherly kindness and charity. Add to the brotherly kindness, charity, that selfless love, that self-sacrificing love. You see in this passage here, God's telling us a lot of stuff. I just would like to have you, as we read it through now, kind of receive it from the side of, hey, how does this affect us together with a great personality of charity? How it is by Jesus Christ that we have it. Oh, I've read this chapter. I've heard it a hundred times. Probably got 200 messages on it. That's good. But I'm asking you today to allow the Spirit of God, as always, let the word of God speak to you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let all scripture that is given to you by God and his inspiration be profitable today, just like you allow it to be every day. Verse 1, chapter 13, let's read through it and then make our message points clear here. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. You notice the phrase, I am nothing. You notice the phrase, nothing. You notice the phrase, not. You notice the phrase, no. A lot here. So on the other side, Paul's describing what charity is, but he also saying what charity is not and how we can get in trouble thinking that we are able to have these great spiritual gifts as a church. I'm just talking church. Just us together. What about our personality? Is it charity? Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. See, very personal. Paul speaking of it, using maybe a little bit of a stretch, a little bit of hyperbole. All these things, though, are pointing to an important subject matter. Verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. I've already seen three knots just in that verse four. Verse five, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether they be prophet, there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. 
whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child when I was a child. I even spake as a child. Think about that again in light of the gifts, in light of the church, in light of who we are. And again, it's very personal. He's saying I, I, I. Now, move that into a collective. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. You're part of a church that has a lot of people that have grown in the Lord and we still continue to grow together. We're not all better than you, but we want to be better in the Lord. Many of you are so much better and much more well-grounded and deeper in charity, and I'd love to be like that. But this encouragement is, hey, when I was a child, <laughs> I didn't really care about this stuff. Of course, verse number 12 and 13 put it all together in this eternal perspective, which I really believe is what verse 10 is saying. Some say when Jesus comes, and I say, I just really believe when it's eternity, when eternity comes, that'll be perfect. Oh, eternity will be perfect. For now we see through a glass darkly. That's how we see. But then, face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know, even also I am known, as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, Father, we have taken a few minutes to praise your name. We've taken time to pray, and as we do so right now, we do it because we need you. And we lift up your name because we extol and love you. And we want you to work in us individually, yes, but as a church, as you work in individuals, to make our personality more like you, charity. I pray you work in this short time of breaking out the word. Uh, I pray, God, even through our time of introduction and looking at scripture and looking at some thoughts that, God, you're already working in our hearts. I just pray that you'd have your way, that the Holy Spirit of God would do the work that he can only do to teach us and exhort us and reprove us and give us that which we need so that we can be more in the life of Jesus Christ to have the personality and charity that we ought to have. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have a great personality. You know, uh, I mentioned it and just alluded to it a little bit, but a lot of guys, we'll just pick on the guys again. I picked on them last week, so we'll pick on the guys for a minute. If they get warmed up okay, then I'll pick on the girls. So here you go. A lot of guys would say, you know, I'd love to be in a place where I'm married or have a spouse. All of us were there at one time. So if you're married now, uh, guys, and you have someone that said yes to you, you ought to say, hallelujah, God, thank you for your grace that someone would put up with me and love me. Thank you. All the other guys are going, huh, of course. <laughs> She's lucky she married me. <laughs> Seriously? My wife did not marry me for my beauty. Although... No. A lot of guys approach dating and approach the woman that they may marry someday with a list of traits, and one of the top ones might be she has to be beautiful. She has to have these incredible looks. And the old phrase then comes out in the world that we live in, don't marry for looks, marry for money. Well, obviously, none of you did that either. Then it comes down to personality. Is the person of Jesus Christ important to the person that you are going to ask to spend the rest of your life with? 
Is Jesus Christ most important? Is the charity that we're speaking of in that person at least with a seed and a hope that it'll grow? Is love in that personality in some form or fashion? You see, there has to be, of course, a starting point. Let me relate it to the church. There are churches everywhere. From the last count in eastern Jackson County, there's over 80 evangelical-type churches just in eastern Jackson County. You're talking about Grain Valley, Lee Summit, Independence, Blue Springs, and the like. If you look it up, they're, they're everywhere. Baptist churches, tons of them. So people can go around and look, and go, you know, I need to find the most beautiful looking church. I need to find the church that's got the best stuff. I need a church that's got the best programs for my kids, the best teaching in the Bible. You know what? I don't care if they have charity, and I really don't care about their personality. I'm just going to marry myself to a church for their looks. For what they can give me. Not their personality. I would say this today to the people that are here. Because obviously, you're within the sound of my voice and the word of God and the spirit of God. I would say that the personality of First Bible Baptist Church is what's going to draw people. The personality and the word of God and the name of Jesus Christ and the gospel and this flavor of charity. Thus, we have a great personality. But we cannot rest on our laurels. Because the key to our personality as a church is the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. How you and I respond to it so that we love others, live faith. And eventually if we get really strong in the Lord or just get the simple courage to obey the command of the great commission to go and tell people there's hope in Jesus and declare it to other people. We have a great personality. That's the approach today. I want to have you understand and be reminded of how important the personality of God's charity is in our church. If there's not charity, those children aren't being taken care of right. If there's not charity, the children aren't learning the Bible right. In discipleship hour, in ministry hour, in the investors, and in the young families, in the refined time, the youth group, primed, all that. I know for the truth of the word of God and by the spirit of God confirmation that there is real charity going on there. That people are serving and loving because they have charity from the Lord and they've decided to push it out. There's somebody that came in very early this morning to make coffee for you. Who was also in the play last night in the drama. She actually was the murderer. There's somebody that made sure that there was coffee beans there. There's somebody that made sure there was coffee just for a cup of coffee. If it's done without charity, it will fall apart and we will be destroyed. If it's in our flesh and in our pride and we're sticking our chests out, I do know the Bible says, pride cometh before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. Somebody who has a haughty spirit is puffed up. I heard we just read that. We don't need to live there. We need to live here. You and I need to stop looking around at everyone else. All of us. And start looking at who we are. Before a holy God that makes this personal with the pronoun I, 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 I. I, continually written in here by Paul to the church of we, the whole body that we preached about with the one member who, where we're one body, many members, one body, as we preached on and taught last week in chapter 12. This is the more excellent way 
is the charity that makes what God has given us in our gifting truly work to give him glory and honor. We say, God, I'm doing this for your glory in Jesus' name, amen, and then completely throw out what we said we were going to do and do it just to get it over with sometimes without charity. Well, I could preach and teach the Bible better than anybody. Well, that's wonderful. I'm happy for you. But without charity, it says it's nothing. It's nothing. It's just blah, blah. Three lesson points. I won't take long. The first one is this. Our great personality reveals we do not believe in a puffed up self but rather a building up of others. I've already said that a little bit. We do not believe in puffed up self. We don't believe in that here in the personality of the church. Neither does the Lord Jesus Christ in his word. Paul the apostle doesn't believe in it either. We believe in building up other people. No matter what state they're in, no matter how far gone, no matter how much you think they're a mess. You just sung about speaking Jesus. I like to think that you would speak the living word of God. His name is Jesus. As you said to me the other day, Brian, we love John chapter number one. <laughs> His light, everybody got it. <laughs> the light of the world. His love. His agape love. Why would I want to take that and trample it and puff myself up and think that I've got something here that's of me and better than what he did when he did it in humility. He did it in meekness. He did it in subjection to the Holy Father. He did it with charity. That's what I want to be. I want that. You see, all the surface beauty that comes with the best gifts means nothing without the true beauty of charity. It means nothing at all. That was a cue. That's a cue. That's a cue. There you go. Praise the Lord. An agape love that is absent of self-importance and present with the essence of self-giving. That's what it ought to be. The surface beauty that comes with the best gifts, it doesn't mean a thing. I'm sorry. You think you've got it all and it's thinking, I don't know. We, we don't. Unless we have charity. Very simply, it's saying, you might be eloquent in how you speak. Bouquets of law, but you don't have charity. It's nothing. You may prophesy. You may have understanding of all mysteries, it says in verse number two. You know what? I can understand all the mysteries that are going on in the world, and I'm going to bring some truth to you. But you don't have any charity. Then it's nothing, the Bible says. I have faith that I can move mountains. The faith that I have, God will move a mountain. If I bring it to him, as Jesus taught, then okay. But no charity, then what's God going to do through that? Nothing. I can be a philanthropist. Or a person that gives out a lot of money. There you go. No, there's people that are philanthropic. They are. They are. Verse 3. I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, there are people that will martyr themselves for the cause. Cause of what? But if it's charity, it's something. If it's not charity, it's nothing. That's what the scripture's saying. This is the more excellent way. A couple verses you're very familiar with. I'm just going to put them up there. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You know that one. Knowledge puffeth up. We need to know things. And he is referencing that, hey church, at Corinth, I want you to know that I know you know about what it means to have things that are offered to idols that you touch. But I started out in verse number 1 of chapter 12 saying, I would not have you ignorant. And so you grab the knowledge, but if you get the knowledge but there's no charity, then the knowledge will puff you up and the charity is not even there. But if you have charity, then what does it do as a church? We build people up. We don't puff up self. We build others up. That's charity. Charity is what can do that. Charity edifieth. 
By the way, was there anybody in young families this morning? Feel like I'm beating up on you? We knew. We just had a little setup here. Holy Spirit setup. Because here's the passage. Let all your things be done with charity. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. There's others. I read one last week from 1 Peter. I put it in to finish. Let all your things be done with charity. That is the personality of our church at this time. I'd love it to grow to be even deeper where it's more. Because our personality needs to reveal that, hey, we're not about puffing up. We're about building up others. We need to build other people up through the scriptures. Through the word of God. We can be in one place wanting to build somebody up and tear them down in the next minute. Let's get to a place where more charity works. Where charity never faileth, that love never fails. Our second point. Our great personality reveals something else. We do not believe in hollow lip service. So if you believe in that, then we need to leave, get some of that out. We need to let the Lord's word work in us so our words have meaning. That we don't speak with empty words of lip service, but rather we hold to genuine love. Hey, I'm going to pray for you. Hey, I'll be there for you. Hey, I'll give you a call. And I don't do that. That's not genuine love, Mark Brown. You've just come to a place where I need charity so that doesn't fail. Because charity never faileth, but Mark Brown's way of love, it fails a lot of times. I got too busy. I forgot. I was going to do that, and I'm so sorry I didn't make it. Some of those are legit, and then there's other times where, without charity, I, I'm a mess. Without God's working in my life to bring me just a, just, a, just a penny's worth of charity, I beg for this. You live long enough in the Lord, and some of you understand what I mean. I love to have more of this in my life. I need more of this in my life. Jesus had lots. So much so that he loved the ones that beat him to death. As we come to the celebration of the resurrection in just a few weeks. That's the way I want to live. I don't live like that. So conditional. So predicated on myself instead of him. As his bride, Jesus is our standard for faith, godliness, and charity. Our goal as the body of Christ concerning our personality is charity. Charity is the glue that keeps marriages and families and churches together. It says there, in those verses, chapter number 13, verse 4, it's up on the screen. Charity suffereth long and is kind. I couldn't find any better verses than what's written here. <laughs> Charity envieth not. So it's something that it is, it suffers long and is kind. Something that it's not, it's envy. Charity doesn't envy. Charity vaunts not itself. I don't know if you really see the deep meaning of that. Some would say that they're two words that mean the same thing. Well, they may be two words in the same coin, but they're a little different. Vaunting yourself means, yes, that you lift yourself up and you're about your words and your presence and what you can deliver, and you want others to respond to feed that. The person that's puffed up does not care about the audience. They are lifted up and puffed up about themselves, and they don't care if anybody pays attention to them at all. They're closely related. But charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Charity does not behave itself unseemly. The only other time in your Bible that it appears, the word unseemly, is when it says in Romans chapter number 1, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat, that's in the place of God gave it, giving up the world and their sin to their vile affections. 
living unseemly. A person that lives in that place of being unseemly basically says, hey, you know what? I don't care what my behavior does to anybody. I'm going to do whatever I want whenever I want it, and I don't care about the consequences to me or anybody else. That's an unseemly behavior. Charity does not do that. It says, of course, as it continues on there in verse number 5, it doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. Think no evil. You can go through each one of these. Rejoice with not in the... Oh, people that rejoice in iniquity. Yeah, you know what I did? And I don't know. The Lord's been really good to me and gracious to me and hasn't punished me yet. And then there's the other people that rejoice in other people's sin. Charity doesn't do that. It rejoices in truth, it says in verse 6. It bears all things. Don't you love when people bear the things of your life? They believe all things of the Lord. They hope all things. They endure all things. They're in it all the time. Charity never faileth, it says up there. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they'll fail. Tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. People want to have the ability to prophesy and speak tongues. We'll get into that next week. Very simply, tongues is another language that is used to give the gospel to the Lord Jesus Christ. An unknown tongue is a perversion of the gift made up to give man glory where there's no interpretation and there is nothing to be done for it other than to have the person that's executing that to be on a fine line of blasphemy. But if you had those tongues and those prophecy capabilities and you didn't have charity, it's nothing because charity never faileth. Remember what we said earlier just a minute ago. We don't believe in hollow lip service. We believe in genuine love. And lastly, our great personality reveals we do not believe in being a child. I mentioned it a minute ago. This is a simple one. A lot of depth to it, but a simple one. We do not believe in being a child, but rather the grown-up in the room. Not, I'm better than you because I'm the grown-up, but rather to be grown up a little. Well, I'm not grown up much. I need to grow more. Praise the Lord. There's many people here who would love to come alongside of you to have you grow. But we don't believe as a church in our great personality in charity, if it's in charity, that, hey, being a child is the way I should go. Because when I was a child, I spake as a child. I thought as a child. I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then shall I know even as also I am known, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is genuine. It's sincere Christian love. It is love that emanates from one source, and that is the Holy Spirit. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is Him working in you. With the Word of God, listening to what He has to say, and you know continually having the Holy Spirit make charity in your life real and genuine and sincere. It is not man-made. It cannot be self-generated. It originates and finds its birth in God alone. I want that. I want that. I hope you say to yourself, I want that. I do want that kind of charity in my life. I want that kind of love life and love language of the Lord, which says, I prefer others more than myself. I prefer the person in the room to be more important than me. I'm not going to act like a child and get all the attention on me. Genuine sincere Christian love, that's charity, and it comes from God and God alone. Colossians 3, verse number 14, we've heard it a number of times since our Acts 1-8 conference, and above all these things, put on charity. So we're told in 1 Corinthians, all things done with charity. Colossians 3, above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, the glue of 
that keeps families together, as I had up on the screen earlier. It's the glue that holds churches together. It's the glue that keeps marriages together. 1 Peter 4, verse number 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Oftentimes, I'm waiting for someone else to exhibit that to get me off the hook. Sometimes we're waiting for some other church to do the work in the community that we've been called to do, because all of us have been called. And I thought that other churches would just do more of those campaigns and door to door, and they would just they would just win people to Jesus. We could just sit back and. We are to put on. And then we, above all things, are to have charity. So maybe today in our prayer time, it would go something like this. Lord, Jesus Christ, equip me to add to our great personality. Because this is your church. That ought to be our prayer today. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer. As the music plays in the background for our invitation and prayer time, let me just ask you, very simply, have you ever experienced the love of Jesus Christ by being saved and born again? And you know that, hallelujah. But maybe today, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you've never called out to the Lord to save you. You've never admitted that you're a sinner. You've never believed on Jesus to save you. You've never confessed. I'll be up here today after service to talk to you. I'd be more willing to show you what the Bible says about what it means to have this love change your whole life. Our Father in heaven, I pray in the name of Jesus for this invitation time and prayer time for everyone here that they would just look at themselves. God, speak to each person even more so than you have already. You've already been speaking to us all by your spirit, by your word. I pray in this time that we would say, Lord, equip me. Make me what I need to be in charity to make the personality of this church family and this church body even more because we're your church. In Jesus' name, please stand.